Tonight we have a, a, a mixed evening, a split evening between uh, Mitchell, Mitchell Orchard, the managing director of Seagars, and Benjamin Potok, the international relations manager. I think I've got that right, or international relationship manager for Bovida. So after dealing with Bovida for 10 years, I've been t saying the word wrong, and it's Bovida, not Bovida. So, can I ask you, can you ask you all to put yourself on mute, like Ron, please? Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> just I'm cleaning them up now. Always yeah. trouble with Ron, always. Yeah. Wait, wait till the crisp packet comes out. And uh, So we're going to do in two sections tonight. Um, we're going to start off by uh, having a chat with Mitchell. Uh, we're going to look at the, I don't want to call it a private label because it's more than that. Um, the work that's been done on the auction selection, particularly in the New World. So we'll look at three of the cigars which you got in your sampler packs. Um, we, I don't want to go through them all just now because the whole point of tonight is to talk about them. But in your sampler, I would recommend if you've chosen your cigar already, that you probably start with the Orchant Oliva or the Alec Bradley Orchant uh, selection. And then leave the Drew Estate as the third cigar, depending on how long you want to be on screen for. I would definitely go for the Alec Bradley first before the Oliva. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's all, yeah, different, different palettes. The second part of the evening is um, cigars are a very expensive hobby, um, particularly in the UK because of our taxation. So really looking after them is paramount. So... Bovida are the, the market, the, the global leaders, uh, not just for cigars, but premium tobacco. A lot of the cigar makers around the world um, put Bovida inside their packs already in transit to ensure their cigars are transported um, in perfect condition. So tonight you're going to go back to science school for a little while, and Benjamin is going to explain the secret of Bovida and explain how the this fantastic product works. So whether you're a newbie starting out and you want to know how to care and look after your humidor, whether you're somebody who's got a nice collection and you just want to be able to look after them on a day-to-day -day basis, or whether you're a serious collector and you want to know how to age them, tonight uh, Benjamin will guide you and give you tips on all three. Um, and then if you check out the chat uh, side, through the evening, please put your questions into the chat and we'll give you the opportunity to ask Mitchell or Benny the question. But in the chat room, you'll see that Alan's put a, a little competition that we're going to run and you are going to have the opportunity to win a Bovida humidor, which comes with two 60 gram packs, or a Bovida butler, which, uh, or a pack of 60 gram pouches which will last you more or less a year. So the idea is we want you to take a picture of tonight, uh, put it on your Instagram account. We want you to put at uh, Bovida, at Seagars, at New World Cigars UK, and then put two specific hashtags for my humidor, and, and hashtag Bovida Masterclass, Bovida Masterclass. Tomorrow, once we've reviewed all the posts, we'll put the names in a hat and we'll pick them out and three of the guys on the, in the room tonight will win these prizes. Or if only one of you enter, somebody will go home with all three. Yeah? So that's the, the housekeeping. Ask your questions as you go. Um... And we'll just play it by you guys. Relax, get your cigar going, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. So, Mitchell, uh, this is a, a rule reversal, really, for us. <laughs> so, I hope it's good fun for you, as it will be for me. Um, people think getting into the cigar retailing business is really, really easy. And we get approached every week by someone who's going to change the world and you know, they're going to become the cigar retailer of the, of today and tomorrow. So, if you could explain your background 
of where you where you did before cigars, what made you get into cigars, and then what you know in an interview when you go to a job interview, which I haven't had to do for a while, uh-huh. you always get asked a stupid question: Where do you see yourself in five years? So when you set up your this business, where did you see yourself in five years? So there's a lot of questions there, but basically just tell us your background and on you go. Yeah, that, that that is a lot of questions in one go. Um, I'll try, I'll try and give you brief answers so I don't put everybody to sleep. Um, you, you, your first point was, you know, a lot of people would like to get into the cigar business. And we, we have requests from people that actually every week as well. And it's actually very easy to get into the cigar business. You just need a lot of money and you'll probably lose a lot of money pretty quickly because it's a very, very difficult business. And it's become a more difficult business year in, year out because of legislation mainly. So it's not really highly recommended. You probably make more money running a Subway franchise than running a single cigar shop. Um, my background was actually in the hotel business originally. Uh, in fact, I can go further back. I was trained as a surveyor and I was a commercial estate agent for the first few years of my working life. I started work at 15, uh, left school at 15. So I, I started work very early in the Thatcher years as was done in those days, not so much today. Um, So my background thereafter was uh, in the family hotel business, which is based in central London. We were uh, substantial hoteliers in the West 2 area of London and owned a lot of blocks of apartments. So I worked uh, in partnership with my father for quite a few years. Uh, We split up when I was about 27, and then I went into the petrol station and convenience store business. And um, through that business, in fact, we were selling Havana cigars and all other manner of tobacco. And our main reason for selling Havana cigars was I wanted to buy my cigars at trade price because I smoked so many and still do. So uh, we sold them in our stores very, very successfully, particularly in some of the affluent locations like Cambridgeshire, um, also in Essex, actually thinking about it. Um, So... From then, we decided, that's me and my little young PA at the time, Laura, that we should make a website. Well, she decided we should go on the World Wide Web. And uh, I said, what is the World Wide Web? That was 1993. Um, And she said, well, don't worry, I'll put a website together. So she put a website together and we advertised all over the country uh, in all the main newspapers and business magazines and blow me down. Uh, We were selling a lot of cigars by mail order very, very quickly. Um, Fast forward to, originally the business was called Mitchell Cigar Company. So a little bit of uh, an old fact about the business. Anyway, if we fast forward to 1997, um, I was somewhat forced out of the petrol industry by a price war and had to think, what the hell was I going to do next? Having been rather successful in business since I was 17, in fact, I had my first business. So um, I decided I was going to be a cigar specialist rather full time. And we relaunched the business after about a month or two gap as Seagars Limited. And that consisted of just Laura and me. And we both worked from our bedrooms. <laughs> with uh, 820 Hunters and Franco humidors, you know, the little cabinets. And uh, what can I tell you, 23 years later, here we are with about 75 staff. I think we've got uh, seven locations, about 13 premises. Um, And I think we take more in about half a day now than we did the whole, in a whole month when we started out. So it's been a very long journey. We started, obviously, as an internet e-commerce company uh, with a view to having excellent logistics and giving excellent customer service and really taking care of the product because I was always very much a cigar enthusiast and um, I knew how to look after cigars, not rocket science, but I was not impressed by how other cigar specialists in London and beyond were looking after their cigars. So, of course, I thought I could do a better job, uh, which I think I did. Um, along that journey, we opened, uh, we bought Termo's Tobacconist. I can't remember when, I think in about 2001 or thereabouts. And we opened up more Termo's Tobacconist shops. 
around about the same time, maybe a year or, a year or so later, um, I went into partnership with my best friend, Ron Morrison, who owned uh, Robert Graham in Glasgow, which is a whiskey and cigar merchant. We then went on a bit of a mad expansion to five rather beautiful shops, or they were anyway, um, and, and a couple of websites, which were very, very successful. Uh, we sold that some years ago. Um, and fast forward to even more recently, we did a concept um, hospitality project called Puffin Rooms, as you know, Scott, which uh, was a whole concept that would marry Termos and Puffin Rooms within the same premises, but separate. So it was a concept that would hit all the senses. So you could have a cigar in Termos Tobacconist shop and sampling lounge, and you could take a few steps over to the most beautiful 1920s, 1930s style jazz club lounge that had that has the most incredible range of single malt whiskies probably in the northwest of England, as well as a fabulous uh, menu uh, of um, hors d'oeuvre type style food, tapas style food, um, and live music seven nights a week. So we're trying to hit every single sense there, um, which is which was very successful until the lockdown. We will be reopening in October or thereabouts. So... That's really a bit of a background on my, my very long history in this business. I now feel like a bit of an old boy in the cigar business. Also, along the journey, we, we built a very successful brand of single malt whiskey, Staladieu, multi-award winning. Had a lot of fun with that. Um, and if, you are, you know, if you're asking me where do I see myself in the next five years, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I see myself in the next five minutes, actually. Probably smoking a lot more cigars, if that's even possible. But if you look back to 1997, when you and Laura went into this permanently, did you ever envisage that 23 years later you'd be where you were, or was that always a clear vision you had to be well, the, well, the number one, effectively? That's, that's actually a good question. Okay, so in answer, very clearly, we would never have dreamed that we could have built the business to this, to this size, but along the way we acquired unbelievable partnerships with unbelievable people. Um, I mean, no one ever leaves our company from my partner, Ron, who's been with me for 20 years to Paul, who's now been with me for donkey's years. who was my friend way before that um, to Michelle, our GM, who's been with us forever. Laura has been with us forever. Sarah, our retail operations director has been with us for ages and ages. You know, nobody ever bloody leaves. So we acquire all these, if you like, human resource assets that are incredible assets to grow the business. However, from the get-go when Laura and I started, and we started with a loan of £10,000 from my father because we were both completely broke, um, we had actually no doubt whatsoever that we would be the number one cigar specialist in the UK. There was no failure option and there was only a success option. And we absolutely knew that A, we were better um, than our competition back in those days, who we were very different to today. And we knew one thing was for certain, we had the ability to work harder and we were more tenacious than anybody that we knew. But you've got, you got to understand, we came from a background of being in the petrol service station and convenience store industry. That is 24 hours of very, very hard work. And we were the award-winning retailer within our region and we would be the guys training other people how to run similar businesses within the petroleum companies that we worked for. So that was really hard work. We were trained in stamina and long hours. So for us, you know, to go, to go into the cigar business full time was, to be honest, to walk in the park. We enjoyed the petrol and convenience store business, but we adore being in the cigar business. So it was a completely different game. So we had no doubt whatsoever that we would be number one, but we never thought we would get to this scale because this scale is now, um, you know, it actually uh, borders on being quite awesome or frightening some days, in fact, most days. Absolutely. And I think um, it's quite interesting for me because cigars is a lifestyle. And I think people outside the industry think that this is why we spend our life. <laughs> they don't see the nuts and bolts and everything else that goes on behind the scenes to make the machine work. Yeah. Um, for the cigars it's to a, come from of... somewhere across the planet to, you know, in perfect condition because <laughs> it's such a valuable and a handmade product. Um, it is. It is. I, I, I mean, it is a lifestyle. It's a great, it's a great lifestyle. 
obviously behind the business and behind that lifestyle of the business is an incredible amount of hard work by our management team and, and still myself to these days, you know, I'm still more or less working fullish time um, as is Ron. Um, and it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of admin. There's a lot of incredible amount of accounts work and admin in the background, which soaks up a vast proportion of our working week. But, you know, that's, that's part of the game. And that gives us the lifestyle when we're not doing all that horrible work that we don't like doing, but you've got to do it. What do you think has been the, the biggest, you, you mentioned legislation, and I guess since 1997 the legislation's changed on branding, advertising, what you can do, sampling rooms, what do you think has been the, the biggest issue and what you think you've come up with the best solution that's helped your business? Well, you know, there's been so many issues and literally I remember conversations with the late and rather great Simon Chase back in 1997 because we would talk for ages um, about legislation and I remember literally making myself more or less ill worrying about it and then I realised from year to year not that much was actually happening and it wasn't worth actually making yourself ill over because then you don't enjoy your day's work. Um, because it wasn't actually happening there and then. It wasn't happening immediately. So we would deal with things when they came closer to actually happening and needing to be dealt with. Um, but in terms of what, what were the worst things, you know, the biggest worries was, were always plain packaging, which ultimately didn't happen because of partly, a great part due to my intervention and, and, and contact um, with various people who uh, had influence and common sense and managed to adopt different regulations within the TPD2 um, European legislation to actually give us much softer health warnings and differentiate us between cigarette differentiate between cigarette products and cigars so i think that was probably our biggest success um i think the indoor smoking ban that was a frightener without any shadow of a doubt you know at times laura and i thought when that comes in that's the end of the game and we said well we'll give it another 12 months and then we'll review where we're at because this could really be um the first time that we'll see our figures going down but Strangely enough, that turned out to be a blessing in disguise, of course, because that year of the smoking ban, our, our sales went ballistic. We still don't know exactly why to this day, but we assume it was like a backlash that people were perhaps sick of being told what to do um, and actually took up smoking as a result, which is a bit bizarre. But then we thought the whole smoking ban was was and is bizarre anyway because where's the freedom of choice surely if you don't want to go somewhere because that establishment allows smoking then you don't go there which is fair enough whereas you know i don't go anywhere where i can't smoke that's my choice as well so you know we also got the exemption for specialist cigar shops for our sampling lounges um which was phenomenal um so i think those are the biggest challenges most of which we've managed to work our way through fortunately and successfully. Definitely. So uh, you, you mentioned the stores. Um, some people think you're just an online retailer, but you mentioned Liverpool. I mean, Liverpool is superb. Um, Thank you. The, the, the Tremere side, and then you walk around, you know, outside up and down into the puffing room and hear uh, the, the, the wonderful Tor playing the piano, um, which I think is, she's got a great name and a great pianist and a good singer. Um, you can have a whiskey, something to eat, and then you can sit in the lounge and have a cigar. And what was the inspiration behind that? Because there's nothing like it in, in this country. Nothing. Uh, well, um, for me, there was no inspiration. It was nearly a coffee shop. But basically, we owned the building and I didn't know what to do with it. We opened, <laughs> we'd opened a fabulous cigar shop already on one half of the building we own. And um, my partner, Ron, who had sort of got into semi-ish retirement and uh, was living on his boat and on the beach and in his apartment in lovely Florida um, was was the recipient of a phone call from me saying uh, Ronnie I don't know what I'm doing with this thing any chance you fancy coming back to business for a little while and uh, in fact Ron, it was all Ronnie's idea Ronnie's concept Ronnie's execution Ronnie's design Ronnie's success um, so it's all it's all it's all to blame uh, it's all for Ron to blame for, for, for puffing rooms for its success so yeah, it's not me. I'm not the ideas man in the business. It runs, runs the creative side. I'm, if you like, more the management side. So, going on to the auction selection. All my idea, not Ron's idea. <laughs> so, 
The very first one you would have done, uh, or sorry, that's not very good grammar. You can edit that. The first uh, auction selection that you would have chosen would have been a Cuban, I, I assume. Yeah, it was actually um, more by luck than design because, in fact, I was approached by uh, my friend John Darnton, who was the sales director of Hunters and Frank Out for many years. And I had a very great relationship with him. And he was the one who, in fact, suggested we could uh, that they could make a special edition for me. I could select the cigars. They double banned them for me. And uh, it would be a small edition. And the first one was the, the first regional edition, in fact, um, in the world when that series started, which was the Ramon Ayones Bellicosos. Um, and we had 64 boxes made. They were double banded beautifully um, and dressed. The boxes were dressed by Hunters and Franco. We selected them. They were amazing. They sold in about two seconds. And that's become an ongoing sort of rolling program every year. We release 32 or 64 boxes of Havanas that are auction selection. I've selected them at Hunters and they've banded them for me. And generally we've picked some real cracking great cigars. There's been one or two that have been a bit troublesome, but hey, that's Havana cigars, but generally they've been really excellent. And then the, the, the whole um, project evolved into, well, we're doing this very successfully in very small batches of Havanas, but now New World cigars are very, very important to us very important to our customers and therefore we should really try and see if there's a way of doing it with new world cigars hence i think i came knocking on your door and saying what do you say scotty yeah no it's interesting because i mean i i, I took over tour 2012 and um i guess a couple of years before that you know it was a different company perhaps and um I can remember us talking and, you you know, it was almost like, so going back 10 years, Cuba was like 95% or some outrageous figure against 5% of what, what was called non-Cuban in those days. And um, I guess that, 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 that switched around a wee bit now, hasn't it? Well, it, you know, it's been switching around probably for the last, well, actually, since, since you took over tour, <laughs> it's been switching around dramatically. So when I started, we were probably about 99% Cuban. I think the only other, the only New World cigars we were really selling, I think, was Santa Damiana and Don Ramos. Um, I'm not even sure either of those two exist anymore. Yeah. I think they're off the market. Um, but as the years went on, you know, the generations change. In fact, I've been in the business so long, sadly, my original clients have died, which is... Uh, very sad, if not bizarre. Um, and so the generations change and tastes change and the industry's evolved. And more importantly, New World cigars actually have improved dramatically. You know, we always had great Davidoff cigars, without a doubt, although some would say the original classic ranges were a little bit boring. Um, but that's changed now uh, because, of course, they've, you know, uh, expanded the ranges dramatically and the, the depth of the blends are incredible. Um, so... You know, what happened is the whole buying patterns of customers evolved and changed. And every year we could see not so much people switching from Havana's, but the new generation buying New World or New World and Havana's. So Havana sales never went down. They're still going up. But New World cigars expanded the market for us. I guess it's expanded the market generally for UK cigar specialists that jumped on the bandwagon um, and, and probably in the world. Um, so, I mean, if we fast forward to present day, I think we're probably predicting something like 35 to 40% new world cigar sales this year. And we're on stream by the end of next year to go to about 50, 50 of ours to new world. But, you know, I'd stress it's not, uh, taking market share from the Cubans because the market is just growing. Developing a new marketplace. No, it's funny because I can remember. Um, so this is going back 2013-14. We we did a cigar night together with Alec Bradley at um, Cambridge. So it must be 2013-14, something yeah. like that. And I can remember you saying to me, "What do you notice about tonight?" And I just thought, "Well, there's a group of guys enjoying themselves," you know. He said, no, what do you really notice about tonight? And I'm, yeah, just a group of guys. And, and you said, just look at the age group. They're all in the late 20s, early 30s. And you, you, you made the point to me that, the, you know, the, 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 the age profile when you have a Cuban cigar night is considerably higher. 
And that's always stayed in my head because all the cigar nights we were doing at that time were that kind of age. So I didn't see anything different to what you were saying, you know. Well, I think the interesting thing is that the new generation that's come through um, smoking cigars are more open to trying different Absolutely. cigars. You know, Absolutely. It's my, my silly old analogy that I like dark Coke, but occasionally I want a dark Sprite, you know. And I think the new generation, they're trying a few Cubans. They may like them, may, they may love them, but at the same time, they're trying Nicaraguans, Hondurans, Peruvians, Dominicans, and they're mixing it up a bit. I think variety is the spice of life with cigars, you know, until you settle on what you really love, and then you might stick, you know, eight, eight cigars out of 10 with that cigar that you love, and every two additional cigars, you might change it up and see what's new or what's different. But I think variety is the spice of life, and our industry is amazing at, you know, bringing out new blends and new sizes and new brands even. Um, and some of them are really great. Some are terrible, but some are really great. But people in this new generation coming through are at least willing to try. Now, when I started out, nobody was willing to try anything other than they were smoking there. Upman Majestics, Upman Petit Coronas, Monte Cristo Number no. 4s, you know, Monte 2s. That was, that was it. They were stuck on what they were stuck on. If you'd suggest, hey, why don't you try this? They'd say, no. I don't smoke that. I smoke this. So it's very different now. The whole industry's changed. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Has changed. Uh, so I, I remember you, as you say, knocking on my door around 2014. Um, said, right, I want a, a, a Levers an Orchard um, Selection Cigar from the New World. Where are we going to go? And we were at the IPCPR or the PCA or whatever it's called these days, which is a trade show in America. Um, And basically we approached uh, Jose Oliva and Brian Shapiro. Uh, And it was funny because these guys don't make private label cigars, you know? And not only did you want a private label, in their, their words, you wanted their name on the band with theirs. Absolutely. So it was a double, uh, a, a double. Um, I don't know what the word is. To spam me yeah. to then say, okay, we want a cigar for the UK for Mitchell. We want his name on it. We want your name on it. It has to be a partnership arrangement. And surprise, surprise, they accepted, <laughs> and uh, it was fantastic. So, I mean, I don't want to bore you with the detail. Do you want to do that? <laughs> Well, well, the first step is they send a load of samples. Yeah, that's my favourite step. <laughs> yeah. And it, so, I don't think it was that simple. I know we had a very good relationship with Jose and Brian, um, but I think they thought initially we were a bit mad, particularly when we wanted co-branding, which was, you know, the whole ethos of the project of Orchard Selections to co-brand because that way I'm endorsing their brand and they're endorsing the blend that I've selected. Um but certainly they, uh, they ultimately agreed it would be, you know, a cool project to do, even though it wasn't a norm for them. And they went with it and they, they did an amazing job. It took a hell of a while. But for me, the best fun of it all was obviously selecting the blends. And, you know, the process is the same whenever we uh, select blends. They send numbered samples. I sit in my office with my GM, Michelle, next to me, smoking her out, literally lighting them up comparing, making my notes, emailing all the things I like and don't like about each numbered sample, sending the email over to you, you send it back over to Oliva, they send another load of samples and the process continues until I go, ah, number three, nailed. So, I mean, that's essentially the process. But the great thing is, is you can say to them, I want this profile. Yeah? But they don't tell you what, what the tobacco is in the cigar, because that would, um, psychologically, you would think, oh, I'm not keen on this, or I'm not keen on that. So you just have to smoke A, B, C, D, E, F, until yeah. you get to like Z, Z. And uh, that's the one. And, um, and that's only the first part, isn't it? The cigar. You've then got the branding. You've got the box. And I always remember, Oliva got lucky, and I guess... We got kind of lucky as well because Oliva got awarded the number one cigar in the world in 2014. And it was in the Millennial box, which is a superb 10-count box. 
And we said, that's the box we want. Yeah? And they gave us it. So the the the, the Orchard Oliva comes in a very, very similar box to the uh, Millennial box, which was the best cigar in the world and, um, in 2014. So the combination of those two things, the timing couldn't have been better, could it, really, if you think about it? The timing was great, and the branding was, was excellent. I remember when we saw the samples of the, of the box branding and the labels, the cigar bands, we were blown away, absolutely blown away. Then, of course, there's always this scary moment when you actually get the production um, yeah. version that comes through, and you smoke them, and you hope to God they're actually going to taste the same as the samples that uh, you've gone through the whole selection process but in fact there was nothing to worry about because they were exactly the same and they are to this day i mean the blend integrity is just phenomenal and oliva are the most phenomenal company they are just professional beyond professional they were such a pleasure to deal with and they still are to this day even though the ownership has changed although brian and shapiro is still yeah. um, there but uh, amazing oh hey, ray's got a box <laughs> ray's got a box he's holding it up oh good man good man <laughs> Well done, Ray. I hope you bought that in the UK. And what I want to ask is, why is Anthony looking like he's in prison? Anthony, are you in prison? Has your wife put you in prison again? <laughs> oh, dear. So, I'm, tell me, I'm, in, I'm in the back garden. Oh, OK. It looked like you were in a prison, man. So, you called them skinny. There's a 5 by 43 shorty 5 by 50 and chubby 4 by 60 Where did you get the names from? Actually, I think that might have been a Ron again, being the creative guy. Um, I'm pretty certain Ronnie always does the names. The only names that I've done were for the Drew Estate, which was signed off by Ron as well. But uh, I'm pretty certain he said, look, just keep it simple. You know, Petty Corona, it's skinny. You know, a, a Robusto is a, a shorty and a nub is going to be a chubby. So I thought, you know what? It's actually quite funny and it's kind of cool as well. So let's just run with that. And I remember the launch party we had at Norfolk. Brian Shapiro flew over for that, if you remember. Oh, yeah, that was a good night. Um, and we stayed in the uh, the Chinese restaurant that doubles as a hotel. Yeah, we set the fire alarms off. It's still a first for me. I've never stayed in a Chinese restaurant with with rooms above it before. Don't knock and, it. It's uh, fantastic. We huffed the hell out of that place. <laughs> we the toast in the morning to cover the smell of the smoke of the cigars. Oh. All, all I remember is waking up in the morning, going to my room, opening my door, and someone had left a, some kind of thing of flowers at my door. And I think someone had gone round and left gifts at everybody's doors that we were. Yeah. Crazy. But that, that was a really good night. I remember that. And, uh, yeah, we probably can't talk about it too much. So, interestingly, that still today, as far as I'm aware, remains the only dual-branded Oliva cigar. Somebody can find out, and they'll probably challenge me, but they might make a private label for, um, or they might double band for, like, the TAA in America for the association or something like that once a year. But to the best of my knowledge, there is no other Orchard, eh, Oliva double-branded cigar. No, so there you go. So five years later, it's still a great cigar and doing very well. So the next project we started on was the Alec Bradley, because you said now you've got a Nicaraguan, you wanted a Honduran. Correct. So we went to wee Alan Rubin and uh, Ralph Montero. Uh, you see the, the band? Uh, it's just amazing, the, the work Alec Bradley did on this. And again, Alec Bradley do not make private labels. They, I think they do a limited run for the TAA every year, and that is it. So again, not only are you asking Alan Rubin to put your name on the cigar, you're asking him to put his two sons' names on the cigar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great story because I think actually the bands and the boxes took longer to make than the actual cigars. But they get, we got a great result, fortunately. Um, so I, I remember we had conversations with them again at RTDA. I can't remember where, New Orleans, Vegas, somewhere or other. And uh, we moved to the project to them. And it took ages to really get off the ground. I think it started moving, actually, when Ron and I went to their offices in Florida. And uh, we were doing some sampling of some potential blends. And it's always blind sampling, you know, there's no bands at all. And uh, George Souza gave us some Petty Coronas, I believe, and we smoked them. And 
Ron and I literally both said, wow, at the same time. We, we were like, what on earth is this? This is just the most unbelievable cigar. And George said, it's the ricest blend from the ricest factory. And we were like, just totally blown away. We said, that is the blend we want. So that is the blend we got. Um, and that's been very successful. That's, a, that's the other end of the strength and uh, body scale to Oliva. Oliva being our Nicaraguan with a bit of nick kick, a lot of body, a lot going on, a lot of strength, a lot of body, and a, and a ton of flavor. This is at the other end. This is lighter on the strength side. It's medium bodied. It's full flavor, but it's a very sweet tasting cigar. Every size, I think there's six sizes now in the range. Every size is very, very sweet tasting in character. So it was great to have both sides, the strong cigar, the lighter cigar. Uh, and that's been a fantastic project because we love Alec Bradley as a brand. We love the guys at Alec Bradley and they made us amazing cigars with first class packaging. So that's, that's been a real uh, amazing project. We're very proud to have worked with well, both companies. And I think as well with Brian coming over for the Oliva launch, George came to Liverpool uh, two years ago. Um, I, I'd love to see, uh, George Souza came to Liverpool to help us launch the, the cigar two years ago, the original um, blends. I would love to see George Souza on one of these Zoom rooms. Um, yeah. Could you imagine? No one else would be able to talk. <laughs> oh, oh, well, he would start off by uh, apologising for, uh, if anyone's offended, leave the room now. Um, yeah, stand up comedian. Stand up. Give us those Alec Bradley cigars. Sorry, I'm just letting oh. Anthony out of prison for a minute. Oh, yeah. you say, so, we launched the three sizes skinny, shorty, chubby two years ago, and earlier this year, you've got the three new small packs. Yep, so, and what's, what's interesting, we got the little Archie. Sorry, Archie, oh, yeah, twisty and pointy. And pointy. Say it how it is. <laughs> the idea of being lovely little small packs fit in your jacket pocket. If anybody wears jackets these days, I certainly don't, unfortunately. Ricardo certainly does. We're very impressed, Ricardo. Thank you for dressing accordingly for this evening. And, um, you know, great small format, accessible sizes, same rices blend as the core range. Uh, same flavour expression, not easy to scale up or scale down a size of cigar and maintain the blend, but we've done it very, very well, I think. Um, and also super popular. Packaging is absolutely great. Um, Anthony, have you got the packaging? Can you show? Oh, there we go. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it's very cool. And then when you take the <laughs> Calebra... You know that is the only one they make in their factory. It's a good and, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure Ralph wrote it down on his pad when we said, "Right, we want this. We want this five by thirty nine Calabria." And I'm sure he wrote it down, have, not having a clue what the hell we were talking about. <laughs> but they made it, and it's still it is the only Calabria Alec Bradley make. Yeah, they did a good job on it. It's not not easy to make a handmade Calabria that actually has a decent draw. And a yeah. decent blend, but they, but they yeah. nailed it. Yeah, so they, they, they did a fantastic job. So the last cigar is the Drew Estate. So Drew Estate Orchard. And just to keep the, 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 the same thread going, as far as I'm aware, this is the only Drew Estate that's got dual branding on it as well. Jonathan Drew does not give up his brand very easy, believe me. Uh, you saw Jonathan here a few weeks ago, and it's all about Drew, Drew, Drew. So to get dual branded with Drew Estate. But this was one of these uh, drunken, well, that wasn't drunken. It was a conversation in a bar in Vegas that started this conversation with David Salem. Yeah, we were drunk. And the next thing we know, it was happening. And we're like, shit, did we agree to this? <laughs> or did they agree to this, you know? And uh, the rest is history. Well, Johnny Drew is another guy I greatly admire in the industry. And again, we love the brand. The brand is super successful for us. Um, we've sent our guys over to the factory, I believe. It's massively impressive yep. in Nicaragua. And hence we thought, well, let's do another co-brand with them. You know, we're endorsing them. They're endorsing us. 
I'll select the blend, I'll select the sizes that I think will hit the spot for my clients in the UK market. I'll get the price points right. Um, and we'll make another successful line of cigars exclusive to cigars and turbo shops. Um, again, I think we nailed it. It's very different to the other, the Oliva and the Alec Bradley. It fits in very nice into a little slot in our range um, of exclusives. And it's worked very well. Um, you know, Johnny Drew coming over for the launch was really a trip. He's a crazy really? guy. Um, you just have to give him a few words and he talks more than me, 10 times more than me. And uh, it was a great evening. And it was, uh, it was very successful in launching the brand. Um, we had some pre-release cigars they sold in about a day, which was hysterical. Um, and yeah, it's got a lot of traction. It's got a lot of, it's got a lot of followers, a lot of devotees now. So I'm very happy with that co-brand. It was excellent. And I think as well, it's testament that we had Jonathan on here, what, four weeks ago or something like that? Five weeks ago? I can't, time just flies away at the moment. He's actually still, it's, it's, he's still talking. Sorry? He's actually still on the Zoom. He's still talking. Yeah, well, I was, it's still his only international uh, virtual health that he's actually done. So that says a lot about what he thinks. So you should take that as high praise. Um, he's some guy. But it's interesting. I mean, the cigars are a little bit lightweight, middleweight, heavyweight are the three uh, sizes. Is there a knockout? Okay, that was that's the answer to my question. Um, and a bit a bit technical on this one because I think it's quite interesting. There's six different tobaccos in this cigar, so I'm going to have to read from a bit of paper because I can't remember them all. But the actual um, wrapper is a stock cut grown in Connecticut, which is actually the same tobacco that you would find in some of the Liga Pravadas. You take the binder. Uh, is from Indonesia, and then the filler is a combination of tobacco from the Dom Rep, uh, Basuki in Indonesia, Connecticut broadly for Nicaragua. So the actual blend and recipe of the cigar is actually a much, much more expensive cigar than we've managed to achieve. Than um, It should be priced so much higher than you are. Yeah? Seriously. It's, um, Absolutely. I mean, Johnny Drew wasn't messing around when he was making these cigars it's all the prima leaf it's the best tobaccos um and it's an amazing blend uh he didn't scrimp and yeah i mean as prices go in the, the crazy uk market i think it's good value for the cigar yeah. that it is sure. um and i think i think he you know was very fair on pricing um considering the quality of the leaf in that product yeah no it's superb so what's next for the auction selection range that's a good question. Um, I think I believe we still have a project on the go with Lito Gomez. Correct. The food, the food. No, the, listen, the guy's working at 30% capacity just now. Yeah, everything's on the um, go with the corona. The, the box factories are all working. At, uh, everything's getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Um, if I was a betting man, I'd say spring next year again. Yeah. But that's, that's, everything's designed, isn't it? The blend's been chosen. Everything's ready to go. But if you don't have boxes and you don't have tobacco, you, well, sorry, so you don't have staff, you can't make them. So yeah. that, that's still on the go. Yeah. So that'll be your Dominican. But that's a secret. Nobody knows about that. <laughs> sorry. Oops. <laughs> Oh, uh, <laughs> in the meanwhile, we've got uh, Plasencia auction selection that's just come out. Um, what else have we done? We've done the Davidoff auction selection. Uh, we have our Inca secret blend, which is not auction selection, but it is my blending, uh, which is hyper popular. Um, what else have we done? I'm sure I'm missing one. Regis auction selection, also from Nicaragua. Uh, also made Ooh, by yeah. Plasencia. Uh, another lovely cigar, great value cigar. Mm -hmm on a different sort of price range and quality range to, for example, um, the Oliva, it's a step down, but a very accessible blend. So we've got quite an all encompassing range just about for every cigar smoker. And hopefully at every price break that suits everybody out there in the marketplace. And it's always, you know, popular sizes. I never go for anything too massive because 
in, you know, in the UK, everything's about excise duty, which is based on weight. So as you go really big, the tax goes crazy, the price goes crazy. And I'm not sure we've all got time for big cigars these days. I think, you know, for me, Robusto size is about where it's at. You know, it's a good 30, 40 minute smoke. And uh, we try and keep those popular sizes. So um, it just appeals to the wider market of our clients. It's quite interesting because I read something this week that um, the Toro has now become the number one size in America. Yeah. You I know, that um, that's not the case in the UK by a long way. We're, we're still a robusto country um, by, by a long, long way. And I don't see that changing because of our climate, I guess more than anything else. Um, yeah. So my last question for you, Mitchell, is what's next for Seagars and Termius? Is there anything you can share or is it watch this space? Uh, it's always watch this space because we're always expanding. <laughs> we're always doing something. Uh, we've just acquired two additional warehouse buildings for our mail order division, which is our biggest division. Um, so that's, uh, they'll be coming on stream First, uh, first of October or thereabouts. We have other retail acquisitions planned and in fact going through currently. So we're hopefully going to be opening some more very lovely cigar stores to add to uh, Liverpool, Chester, uh, Nutsford, Norfolk and Mayfair. So we'll be adding different strategic locations for retail, which will have our overall offering of sampling lounge whiskey, premium spirits, um, pipe tobaccos, and obviously premium cigars. Um, and that's it. That's it. More of the same. You know, our database shot through 110,000 UK clients last month and is growing exponentially every month still. So we've got a lot of work on our hands just trying to cope with what we're doing, which is very nice, and a few bits and pieces of interesting expansion in the next few months. So you just got to keep watching this space and watching social media to see what the hell we're doing. I will indeed. Well, Mitchell, thank you very much indeed. I mean, certainly we're very proud that we've been part of the the, the project with these three cigars. Thank uh, you. Look, look in the chat rooms asking about the Placentia, but I think you've got one of their evenings coming up to explain all about the Placentia Orchard. So he needs to check in for that one. Is that <laughs> fair? Yeah. No um, and then you can talk about that. But listen, we're very proud to have worked with you on these uh, projects and um, here's on to the next ones. Well, thank so, you, Doctor. We're, thank we're you. very proud to work with you, dear boy. In fact, Tor Imports were our first supplier when we started in the mid-1990s through your predecessor, Mark Acton, um, or slightly predecessor. Um, and in fact, he, he helped me dramatically because he helped me with my range of New World cigars way back then. So we've been a big supporter of Tor and you've been a big supporter of New World. So it's really worked extremely well, I think. So I guess I turn my attention now to Benjamin from Bovida, wherever you are on the screen. Benny? Right here. You're here. Hello, everybody. Good evening, sir. So Good tonight evening. we have Benjamin from Bovida from Berlin. Yes, yep. sir. All the way from yes, Berlin. Sir. We've been yes, waiting sir. patiently. Hopefully, you find tonight interesting so far. I find it very interesting, especially you know, given my background, which you know, you know me. Don't so. I also before I joined Boveda, I I built uh, an online retailer in, in Germany. So, which is not as big as cigars, but we still have some time to to run. So that's uh, that's fun. This is really interesting. I enjoy it. Yes. So we're going to hand over to you now, Benjamin, to talk to take you through the science uh, and answer all the questions that people have got. Um, what I'd like, Alan, yeah, thank you. You've put it in the chat room. You're ahead of me. So get your pictures in to Instagram, and I'm going to shut up now and just give the screen to Benny. And if you've got questions, put them in the chat room, and we'll come back and get you to ask them. Um, if there's something urgent on one of the science charts, and you'll know what I mean uh, when you see them, if you need to interject, put your hand up or something, because it could be we missed that moment, okay? Benjamin. Yeah, thank you, Scott. So what we do, so we have a format which we humbly call the Boveda Masterclass. So, and who wouldn't want to be a master in something? And now you have the chance of, you know, taking the Boveda journey through like the 23 years of 
experience that we have in the cigar world. Um, Scott has mentioned it. I mean, we're um, an integral part of this industry. We're in millions of humidors across the world. We're in millions of cigar boxes across the world by um, some of the leading brands, uh, including uh, the companies that supply the, the stupendous um, Ocean Selection cigars, which will be Viva, La Flora Mexicana, and so on and so on. And um, I just want to just, let's just jump right in. I want to share my screen real quick. And then we are just going to go. If you have questions again, please use the chat function or raise your hand because it can be a little bit technical. Let's see that. Does everybody see that? Is that fine? Yeah. Get some feedback? Yep. Okay. So again, we, we called it masterclass um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's far from being your standard um, company presentation. We really want to educate um, about why humidity is so important for your cigars. And let me start with some it's, it's really like a rhetorical question, you know, so what's crucial for aging and storing premium cigars? And of course you see the answer right in the image right here. So the answer is Boveda. And that really is the masterclass. So thank you very much for your attention. It was, it was a pleasure. No, that's a, that's a joke, obviously. The answer is, and you probably have guessed it, it's humidity because Boveda, we basically for 23 years, we only do one thing. And this is, we will humidify your cigars to perfection. But before we talk about humidity, you really have to take a step back and explain what humidity is, because there are different levels of it. And um, so different kinds of humidity, if you so will. The first one they want to talk about is called water content, also labeled as moisture content in some, in some parts. It's really just the amount of water like percentage-wise, that you have in a thing, in, in, a, in a biomass, in, in tobacco in our case, okay? So from the 100%, um, how many percent of these is moisture, okay? So a drop of water has 100% moisture, obviously, um, and the meatloaf my mother-in-law made last week was pretty close to 0% moisture. Please don't tell her, but it's the truth. Um, the second level is what is called water activity. And as you can see, there has the word activity in it. So it means there must be two types of water, if you still want, right? There's active water and passive water. And that's the case. So we have water that's bound in the cell structure um, and just basically stays there. And we have active water that's movable. Um, that's water that would evaporate first. And that's also the water that's available for biochemical reactions. And when we talk about tobacco and, and we talk about, you know, fermentation, um, we need biochemical reactions, okay? That's a whole bunch of processes, and we will look at them later in this presentation, okay? Um, and the third one I want to talk about is relative humidity, which is pretty much the same as water content or moisture content, but in air, okay, in, in gases. So relative humidity is the amount of moisture you have in the air or in the headspace of a humidor. And um, thus, um, the relative humidity is of course connected to the upper two. So if you think about these two, you know, these two are happening in your cigar or in the tobacco, whereas these two are closely related, okay? So because we said that water activity describes the movable water and then water will evaporate and relative humidity is the amount of water in the air surrounding that in that case. So if you have a closed system like a humidor, these two will be in equilibrium. Okay, and this is actually how you humidify your cigars. You put a humidifier in your uh, humidor, this one will regulate the relative humidity in a surrounding airspace and thus uh, regulate the water activity of your cigars. Okay, so that's pretty technical but it all kind of makes sense. So the, the amount of moisture that you have in your tobacco has an impact on a whole bunch of different levels. And we will talk about all of them right away. The first one is, and we all know this, the mechanical structure, because it kind of makes sense. Um, if a thing has more moisture and it's the same for tobacco or wood or whatever, it would expand, right? And when something dries up, it would contract, and everybody has seen these things like cracked wrappers, um, 
or, or damage has been done to the cigar it has been hasn't been stored well so what happens is keep in mind that in a in a cigar you have between three to sometimes seven or eight different types of tobacco and they all can hold on to uh, a different amount of moisture and and they will shrink or expand to different moisture conditions at different speed rates meaning that in this case which is very typical this cigar has been in in um in fluctuating moisture conditions meaning that it has been shrunken because it dried out and then it was rehydrated fast and the the filler and the binder um, they they expanded faster than the delicate wrapper and thus caused the cracking. Okay, so moisture has an impact on the mechanical structure. And you can see that if you ever happen to smoke a cigar that's over humidified. And uh, you sometimes see that so the wrapper and binder are maybe still burning. But if you have like thickly hero leaves on the inside, um, they really don't burn well. Okay, because they can hold on more moisture because they have a thicker cell structure. Um, and they will just not burn. Okay. So that's point A. Second one is the burn temperature. And here comes the first thing that looks kind of, well, it is scientific, actually. It's, it's from, it's from uh, um, because there's a whole lot of research being done on tobacco, mostly for the cigarette companies. But this would translate to tobacco for cigars as well. So what we see here is basically um, the relationship between moisture content, so the amount of moisture we have in your cigar, all the moisture, to heat capacity so heat capacity it really is defined as pretty much the amount of heat you can apply to a thing before it gets hot okay and you see that there is a, a, a relation between these two but it's not linear in fact you can divide this graph into two parts so one we have a steep curve and then one we have a very flat curve meaning that on this end here red um if you need only to apply just a little heat and it will uh, it will burn really quickly okay while at this end the change is not that drastic anymore um, this the separation here is at about 60 percent relative humidity if you so right this is kind of like the breakdown barrier meaning that um, if a cigar is stored at a relative humidity of under 60 percent or the water activity of 0.60 um, it will burn very fast and very hot. Why is that important? Well, you have to remind yourself what it is that you really taste in a cigar. A cigar is pretty much like a scented candle. And, you know, please give me some props for, you know, finding a, a scented candle that's actually scented with tobacco. But um, think about it because the smoke itself of your tobacco is pretty much flavorless. Okay. What you taste and smell is really the oils and sugars, or it's like the, what we call terpenes. It's the flavor particles that you have in the oils and sugars of your tobacco that are heated prior to combustion, okay? So the minute you burn them, they're gone. You heat them up, they will, the water will evaporate. You will draw all these flavor particles, the terpenes, through um, the remainder of the cigar in your mouth, and this is what you taste, okay? So the faster you burn something, the hotter it burns, the less flavor you will have. And the smoke itself will be very harsh as well, just because it is hotter, okay? Next. It also has an impact on flavor balance. Why is that so? So here's another great um, little graph that looks much more complicated than it actually is. Um, the two things that we look at here is the relationship between the relative humidity in the surrounding head space, being your humidor, and the amount of water your cigar actually stores, the moisture content or water content. Again, there's a relationship between these two, but it's far from being linear. And again, we have two parts. We have one rather flat side and one rather steep side. What does that mean? It means that um, when you store, and by the way, this is 60% relative humidity again, right? 0.6. Um, so we have the same threshold. This means that if you have a change here, this will have drastic changes on this end. So a small fluctuation above 60% relative humidity will have big alterations on how much water will be stored in your cigar, okay? While when you're here on this end, it's not, it's not the same, okay? When you store a cigar under 60%, 
the, the changes in humidity are actually not as important. But then again, it's very dry, you know, so you don't, won't taste a lot. So why is that important? Again, think about it. We had it before. Um, there are six, uh, three, six, sometimes eight different types of tobaccos in your cigar. And they all will take um, a, a different amount of moisture depending on the level. And they all will react differently to the amount of moisture, which means that, well, we, we already learned that you have to store your cigars above 60%. But then, of course, you have to keep your cigar as stable as possible. Otherwise, the balance between all these different tobacco leaves will be off because each of which would um, react differently to the changes by, by adding more or less moisture. And it really comes down to this young man um, that you probably know is Calito Fuente, um, the, the um, owner of Atua Fuente Cigar Company. And one of his, his products, which is this one, it's, you can also find it here, it's the Opus X. And Calito is an integral part in the history of Boveda, actually, because when he has, for the Opus X, he has a very precise idea that the Opus X needs to be stored and smoked at 65% relative humidity. Whereas all the other cigars that he makes are around like 69 or 70% relative humidity. And he built a special storage unit, like a fermentation room storage unit, just for the Opus X, just for this blend. And he, he approached Boveda saying that, well, if you guys are just another humidifier, I don't want to do nothing with you, but if you really do what you say you do, that you keep your humidity stable, we're in business. And up to this date, every box of Opus X is shipped with a Boveda 65, okay? And all around the world, basically. Another point that's very important is microbial pollution, which is just a fancy word for mold um, or mildew um, or, you know, to be anything really um and we are, all have seen this and this there's, there's of course a threshold like all things will start getting moldy at some point for tobacco that threshold is really about 72 percent ish so a little bit over 72 percent and the, the the professionals among you will say wait a minute there is a boulder 72 what are you talking about and we will talk about this in a second okay for now it's enough to know that uh, relative humidity above 72 means an accelerated growth uh, of microbes that might ultimately lead in mold. So if we just summarize real quick. So we have um, kind of like the, the higher end, which is 72. If you store your cigars above 72, you have a risk, a higher risk of mold. You have uneven burns because the tobacco will store different amount of moisture and a bad draw potentially for the very same matter. Uh, below 60%, you have an accelerated rate of what we call terpene evaporation, meaning that, you know, your tobacco dries out and it washes out all the flavor particles in your oils and sugars. You would probably have seen this if, you know, uh, if you forgot a cigar somewhere and it was completely dry. Even if you rehydrate it, it will never taste the same as before. It's impossible just because the oils and sugar have lost so many of these terpenes. Then we have rapid combustion. You know, it burns very fast, very hot. We lose a lot of flavor, thus bad flavor delivery. And we can have cracking wrappers um, if it gets rehydrated. Now, this was, so we differentiate two parts of storing, really. One is storing for smoking, and one is, you know, storing for what in the cigar community is called aging. Not all people, you know, even the expert agree on aging, um, and to what extent and so on and so on. And it's not a hard science, but there's anecdotal evidence, of course, and we all know this. But there are some things that are true and then need to be looked at. Um, this is from a very famous book by a very famous guy, Min Ron Lee. He's one of the most renowned, you know, Cuban cigar collectors based out of Hong Kong. And he divides the different stages of aging a cigar into D3. So you have the youth stage, which is up to four years, where you basically, in the first step, get rid of all the ammonia that's in the cigar. And you will notice this if you have a cigar that's really young, for instance, if you bought like a box fresh Cuban and you try it, you know, like even like 2019 box date or even like, you know, um, maybe even 2018, but 2019 for sure. So you, if you smoke them, you have that really dry throat, a little bit scratchy throat. And this is the ammonia that's still in the tobacco. 
okay? In order to get rid of the ammonia, you have to let it sit. You have to let it ferment for at least like one to two years, three to four years, you're completely rid of it. At the second level, um, for the next couple of years, like the next five to 10 years, um, you get rid of the tannic acids. And you know tannins from red wine, so these are kind of like the bittery tastes, okay? So if you age a cigar beyond that, the, the, the tobacco will be very smooth and even better. And then, of course, in the, in the very long run, you have um, like what did they call old age, um, which of course today is almost exclusively to Cuban cigars because like the other markets are just, you know, not that long around and like the, the process of aging is, is completely different. I understand. And Min Ronni, he said the following, basically the slower the fermentation, the more time the chemical constituents have to mingle with each other, the more complex the flavors are generated. Basically saying that if we want to age our cigars properly, we have to slow down the fermentation, okay? So what is fermentation and especially storing? Again, complicated graphic. Um, this is actually not from tobacco, it's from food, to, uh, but the, the processes are the same. We talk about a uh, process like a lipid oxidation, so it's an oxidative process. Please don't, if one of the question is, so what does lipid oxidation do to my tobacco? I'm not a biochemist, I'm not be able to tell you, okay? But what is important to see is that below here we have the water activity, which we talked about, so that's the active water that we need for the biochemical reactions. And the lower the water activity, the less of these processes we will have, okay? So that's important. This will go down, enzyme activity will go down. So if we want to slow down the fermentation process, we need to lower the water activity and thus the relative humidity in the headspace of our tobacco. On the other hand, we have here the reason, it's labeled like this, on this end here, we see that in this case, and this is different for tobacco, usually for other food products, 65% relative humidity or water activity of 0.65 is kind of the magic spot where you have accelerated growth of mold and bacteria. For tobacco, 72, simply because tobacco has nicotine, which is a poison, you know? So it kills a lot of microbes in the process. Um, and thus, uh, allowing tobacco to be stored at a much, lever, a much lower uh, humidity level than other food stuff. Again, um, so from the 60 to 72 range, um, it is kind of agreed on that the, uh, around 65 or sometimes even 62% is, and again, this is not a science, this is anecdotal evidence, um, is kind of like the sweet spot for aging tobacco while for having tobacco smokable, it's kind of like the 69% or 70% mark, okay? So these are the two differences, and this is why. And, this, and what do you need for proper, proper aging? Obviously, you need humidity, so you need the humidity in the surrounding headspace to control the humidity in your cigars, and that as stable as possible, what we have learned already. Then temperature is also important because air can hold on to different levels of humidity depending on its temperature. Uh, uh, yes, that's right, depending on the temperature. Um, hot air can hold more moisture. Cold air can hold less moisture, which is true for most uh, you know, regions of the world. And the winters are usually drier, the summers are moister, um, so more humid. And um, the same happens even in closed systems. So if you have your humidor, and it's, it's not in a climate control environment in like summertime when it's usually warmer, um, your moisture level will rise even though it's in a closed system just because the air can hold on to more moisture, okay? Um, the third level is oxygen because we have an oxidative process, of course, and we need oxygen to, uh, to support this. So cigars to ferment need a source of fresh oxygen um, how much do we need? That's debatable. Um, some people say, well, I need fresh oxygen every day. Um, some people say, no, it's not the same. But it has to be, at some level, it has to be an exchange of oxygen happening. And having said all this, we have to keep in mind that everything that we do to your cigars, how you store them, how you age them, has an effect on the taste. And taste is a really 
personal matter, okay? So I have a friend, and this is why this picture is up. I have a friend who loves to drink cherry Coke with the cigars, which I find dreadful. I think it, you know, you're missing a lot of flavors and it's just horrible, but he loves it. And who am I to argue with him about his taste, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, so there's really no right or wrong way of doing this unless, you know, you destroy your cigar or you grow mold. But within these, within these boundaries, boundaries um, you can really do literally whatever you want as long as you feel happy about it. So we talked about humidity so long, so let's talk about how to store them. Because at the end of the day, and I wrote it here, your humidor is just a box. You have to manage the humidity inside that box, your humidor, all by yourself. And here is really how it looks like. So you have your tobacco with the, you know, the water activity, which is AW, and you have the moisture content. And on the outside, you have the relative humidity. And these two are mediated by your container, can be a humidor, can be a Tupperware, can be ho however you store your tobacco, okay? And so the quality of a humidor and the factors, so the materials, the tightness of the seal, so how much gas exchange does a humidor allow? Is it made out of wood, which is porous by nature? Um, how good, how well is the lid? How well seals it? Do you have glass? How well does the glass seal? And so on and so on. This has all an impact on how, what you need to do on the inside of that humidor. Okay, especially if you have changing conditions on the outside, because these will have an effect on what's happening inside your humidor if it's not hermetically sealed. And if you think back in, uh, I think, very beginning, you would just add like a glass of water into your humidor. The next level would be a sponge, which is, which I think is a very dumb animal because you pour water over it and then it's close to like 99% relative humidity, which is way too high for your tobacco. And then it just drops in a, curve that looks kind of like this, depending on, you know, how uh, different uh, the surrounding conditions are. So, um, and the, for the beets, it's a little bit better because they won't go up to like 99%. They will stop um, a little bit lower, but it's the same curve. So they don't really stabilize. Um, so they don't give you stable conditions for your tobacco. They're messy because you have to refill. Um, Many people think that, well, but I have um, an electronic humidifier. This is Cig Oasis, can be anything. But uh, if you think about that system, what it really is, is a tank of water, it's a sensor, and a fan, so a ventilator. So whenever the, the sensor measures that, oh, this is too dry, it will blow humid air into humidor until it says stop. But what happens if your outside conditions or the inside is too moist? You know, the, your Cigar Oasis or any, you know, comparable device will not help you and they're kind of expensive as well. So with Boveda, all this is made very easy. And there is a secret ingredient and it's salt, but it's not really secret because, I mean, how many of you have used what is called the salt method to calibrate your hygrometer? Um, basically, what you do, take a little bit of salt, put it into water, blah, 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 mix together, uh, and put it into a bag, put your uh, hygrometer in, and then you set it to 72, right? So, Boveda does the very same thing, but much more convenient and at different levels. Because we at Boveda, we on, don't only use um, table salt, sodium chloride, which has um, kind of like that magic spot at 75%. We use different types of salt for di to achieve different humidity levels. And, and that in a product that's very cheap and very convenient. So if you want it, you could build your own Boveda. But again, why would you do it? So how is Boveda made up? I mean, I already told it. So there's three major components. You have water, which you need to humidify things. You have salt, which is our controlling agent, which will make sure that you will only get what's written on the pack. In this case, 75% relative humidity. But the secret is really the membrane that we have. So the membrane, think of it as it's a very fine grit. It's super tight. Um, it will literally just let water molecules pass in both directions. And if you think about it, water molecules are very, very small. It's just three atoms. You have uh, one oxygen, two hydrogens. So it's really small. So it will keep the salt on the inside and it'll keep all the goodness, all the flavor on the outside. So you never have to worry about it. 
So what is really the, the, the difference for salt against all these other technologies? And I want to show you this as follows. On this side, we have the relative humidity in the surrounding headspace. And here is the amount of moisture that you have. In this case, we talk about glycerin, which is kind of like the next best thing. So this is the glycerin water mix. And if you take, um, you can set this to any humidity level, any relative humidity level, as you can see. Um, but if this mix has to give up or take humidity, you will end up at a different spot right here or right here. So you're never at the point where you left it. Okay. Whereas if you use a bovida, you also go up here at like 27, this one, around about tick, and this has to give up or take moisture, go up, and you're still at the very same level. So bovida has what is a buffer really against changing humidities, okay? And that is the difference. No other thing than salt can achieve this. So if any, everybody else tells you, anybody else tells you, um, but yeah, but we have this and this inside because salt is that and that. Yep, nope. It's just marketing. Salt and that's scientifically proven is the only thing to give you that buffer. Okay. And also, if you think about the performance, let's take all these again out of the picture. Okay. If you th think about this here, we have from 25 to 29, that's like here. Okay. So this is um, why salt is literally the best thing that you can do in order to regulate humidity and it's used in laboratories all across the world. With Boveda we have different types of products. Uh, we have one core product which is our, our Boveda bag, um, our humidifier. It comes in different sizes so we have an 8 gram which is good for 5 cigars. We have the 60 gram that's the most popular which is good for 25 cigars and we have the, the latest is the 320 which is good for 100 cigars in volume. Okay meaning that if you have uh, a humidor that can hold 50 cigars, you would have to have two of the 60 gram boveda or a 320 boveda because you can never over humidify because a boveda would ever stop whenever it reaches 69 or 72 percent. It will just stop the humidification process because it's based on osmosis. You know, it's the water activity of the pouch to the relative humidity of the surrounding airspace. Um, and you need two um, 25. Uh, cigars boveda if you so will even if you only have 10 cigars on the inside because this is the amount in cigar volume okay this is important to understand um, and we have different humidity levels so why is that and we talked about it a little bit but let's just circle it right here so 69 percent is kind of the sweet spot for smoking okay and then we talked about 65 percent which is for aging but also, if you have a humidor that's not hermetically sealed and you live in a humid climate and you need Boveda to take the humidity down to 69, you would use a 65 in your humidor in order to bring the inside, the relative humidity on the inside of the humidor to 69%. And vice versa, um, if you live in a dry climate or your humidor doesn't seal well, um, you need to go up to 72 or maybe even 75 Okay, so 69% is always the sweet spot that is to achieve, but sometimes depending on the, on the quality of your humidor and the outside conditions, you will have to use a different level in order to be at an equilibrium on the inside. And then we have chip, our 84, which is not for tobacco storage. It, it's used in order to season a brand new humidor uh, which, you know, you buy a new humidor, it comes usually very dry. If you put your cigars in, the wood would suck out all the humidity out of your cigars, which is bad. So, um, and there's usually just a little pamphlet on it saying, yeah, you need to wipe it down with like water uh, and then let it sit. But again, if you wipe something down with water, you're at 100% humidity, which is bad. So we have an 84 um, bowl with a pouch that you put into your humidor. You have to wait um, roughly two weeks um, and then you, your cigars can be put into a humidor, your humidor is perfectly seasoned. Just to, re, uh, just to reassess, so we have our tobacco, we have our humidor, and we have the ambient conditions, and these are always interchanging, so we need to put, maybe I should have picture in, because my drawings are so well, but we have the boda that will take care of that process for you.
and we have accessories um, in, in order to uh, help you doing that. We have, uh, which I totally like, um, the, the holders of, for the bobita pouches, which you technically don't need because, as I mentioned, the bobita pouch will not release more moisture than what's written on the pack. So if you have a 69, it will not give you more than 69%. If you have 72, it will not give you more than 72%. But what I like about it is because I, I, will, I will store my boda in the bottom of the humidor. And thus, I use the holders in order to add just a little bit more like, air room surrounding um, the boda pouch in order to have a better circulation of air inside my humidor. Okay? Um, just because it's, well, it's the same with every other humidor. I mean, if you have a humidor with drawers, if you pack the drawers, you would really create a moisture barrier, okay? And I want to avoid that the cigars that I lay onto the boba pouch, which you can do, it's totally fine. So you won't have a soggy side and a dry side, but I want the air to move around a little bit more just in order to have a faster retribution of, of um, humidity in my humidor. And these holders are just perfect for that. We have the hygrometer calibration kit, which is the salt method that we talked about just a second ago. But already packed so it's much more convenient for you and the product that i truly love is the humidor bag especially the big one i gr just grab a bunch of those whenever i travel because you can actually put two boxes uh two 25 count boxes of cigars into this and you can store them in that bag for a year uh, which is great if you travel to cuba to dr nicaragua um, and buy boxes of cigars because you cannot put them into a travel humidor. Uh, so what do you do? You want to keep them perfect, especially when they travel on the plane where the air is very dry, obviously. So this is uh, one of my favorite products that we have. And we have, and you have the chance to win this today, an acrylic humidor, which has, and this is, I love this, it has the humidifiers in the bottom. So why is that actually, why is that a good idea? Um, you have to remind yourself that air, moist air is actually lighter than dry air, which is not very intuitive. But um, if you think about it, if it were, was the other way around, the clouds that are in the sky would be on the ground all the time. Okay? So what happens if you open your humidor, all the moist air will go out the top. Um, and if you put your humidifier in the bottom, you will have a faster retribution from, from the bottom to the top, you know? So, and, and, and on the other way around, you will have to fill it up from top to bottom, which is where most uh, humidors have their humidifier just by, you know, it's logistic design. It's more convenient to put it there. So this is why I think these acrylic humidors by Boveda that are not airtight, but pretty close. Um, and they're beautiful because, you know, you put your cigars in, you can look at your cigars and don't have to look at the Boveda, which is lying on top of it you know, which might be better for marketing maybe, but, you know, I like to look at my cigars when they're on my table, you know, so this is cool. And we have the butler, which you also have the chance to win. Um, tonight, it's a Bluetooth hygrometer and thermometer. You just plug this little device into your uh, humidor and you connect it to your phone. You see the actual relative humidity and temperature. You also see a history uh, as a curve. But the coolest thing is that you can send an alert, notify me, for instance, when the humidity drops below 60% for over two hours, which means that, ah, either way, you know, it, maybe it's become drier on the outside or my boba needs to be replaced. And this thing can obviously be, uh, be bought and it's a pretty, 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 pretty cool thing. I love it. And next um, Christmas, if you have somebody who has everything, this is a really cool gimmick that is really good. And boba is not just for cigars. Um, we already you know, um, supply to the music industry for instruments, for guitars, for violins that are worth thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, we use it for medicinal products, medicinal herbs, uh, where they are legal. Um, and it's becoming more and more legal in more and more uh, markets in this world. Um, and we are trusted partner of all these and many more. So whenever I do a masterclass, I get a message from, ah, but we also are a partner um, of Boveda. Why are we not on that slide? It's like, yeah, because these guys, you know, are buying a little bit more Boveda than you do. Well, buy more and you'll be on that slide. Very simple equation. Here they are again. Um, you know, many of these, um, obviously, some of the leading faces of the cigar industry of today. And this 
now really concludes the master class. I thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Well, I told you you were going for a science class and you delivered Benjamin. Yes. Yeah? Yes. And you can see so it's warm in here. I'm sweating. What's ah. your humidity level? My humidity level so. is close to boiling point. I need a nice Riesling to cool me down. Thank you. So there's a few questions in the in the, the chat room, so rather than me reading them out. Luke, uh, you've got a couple of questions that you asked. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask Benjamin your questions, sir? Sure. Um, first Hello, question. Luke. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, very interesting. Thank you. Um, my first question is um, about calibrating my butler. How often do I need to do it? I did it the first time I got it. And yeah. it's been about six months now. I'm wondering if I have to keep calibrating. Yeah. So I, so I recommend it twice a year. You can do it with every season change if you want. So, but twice a year, I would say, is like the minimum. So every six okay. months. Every so I'm about due on then. Yep. Um, and my other question is about the heat. Um, it's, it's, we've not had the hottest summer here as normal, but... Um, my temperature in my cigar box has been mid to high 20s, uh, which I keep getting an alert telling me it's too high. Have you got any, any tips for keeping the temperature down? I'm not sure what to do. Yeah, so this is a tabletop humidor? Or is like, what, what type of humidor is it? It's, it's just a, um, a cigar box. <laughs> Oh, cigar box. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, but if you, if, like a cigar box, and if you, so the thing is, if, like, this is true for all the tabletop humidors as well, which you just store in your living room or bedroom or wherever you store them. Yeah. If it's not a climate control room, nothing much you can do about it, actually. I mean, you could try to cool it down yourself, like put some ice on it and stuff, but it's really not worth the effort, okay? So this is, but don't worry about it. Just keep, um, just measure the, the humidity on the inside and react accordingly. Maybe use a different uh, different level bobita to to ease out the process. If you see that your humidity rises because the temperature rises, just use a lower RH bobita to to counter effect that um, that rise. Okay. So what do you do? I mean, you all build in an AC to your house. That's the other way. You know, that's that you, that you can do, uh, which is probably nice. Um, you know, with global warming, it could be a good market in the future. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Brilliant, Luke. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert, um, you had a few questions. I know Rob was um, uh, answering them kind of thing, but it's quite good to get them out into the forum. Robert, where are you? Uh, hi, I'm here. If anyone, hi, everyone can see me. Um, yeah, I think most, most of my questions have been answered. Um, I sort of I'm sat here thinking, you know, I've been keeping some Davidoffs and stuff for the past year. And I think myself, oh, I wish I knew this sooner. Um, I don't know if that's, um, I don't really keep cigars that long. I know some of you were commenting that whether Bob would have had a solution of how one can smoke cigars less quickly. Um, if you have an answer to that, then please feel free to put that in the group. But um, yeah, most of my questions were re-answered. Um, I've now realized that I think I might need to buy another humidor because I've got some cigars that I keep to smoke and some cigars to keep to age. Um, but yeah, I think most of my questions have been answered, but um, I found that really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. So, but did the, so um, as long as everybody is happy to sell you a, a new humidor, obviously, um, depending on the amount of cigars you want to age, and it's, you know, you, what you already can do is if you have something that's pretty airtight, like a Tupperware or something like this, you could start with that right away. You know, because I know selecting a humidor is tough because it's always the look of it, right? So you have to fall in love with the humidor that you love and then you find the right one. If you want to separate them right away, you can put them as long as it doesn't smell like a black pudding or something like this. Obviously, you know, please don't put them inside. But, uh, you know, you can separate them right away. Doing that, use a 65 bowl in that one. Maybe take out of a cigar box a cedar wood, you know, take it out, put it in there, put cigars in already. If you want, if you have, and then you have that separation from, you know, long time storing to, you know, storing for smoking. But of course, humidors are nicer. You know, everybody loves nice humidors. Everybody loves nice humidors. And, and if you're on Instagram, Robert, you could win one tonight. 
Yes. I think, yeah, I, think yeah. I might have to might have to create an Instagram account just to just to see if I could win one. Otherwise, Mitchell's going to have yet more money off me. <laughs> I'm sure he won't say no. Um, <laughs> I'm sure he won't. So, Jim, you had a couple of questions, I think, in the, the chat room. Where are you, sir? Hello. Hi. Oh, good evening, sir. Hello, Jim. Uh, kind of being answered. Obviously, I was joking about the um, slowing down the smoking a bit to try and make them last longer, but I'm going through them very quickly. Um, yeah. But going back to what so you're what saying you about... So what you do is if you store them in high humidity, they will burn slower. But then if, you, if it's really high humidity, you might just spill, you know, it's all in the <laughs> a good way rather uh, buy more you know, it's yeah. always a good solution just to buy more <laughs> but on a serious note going back to what you're saying about because like at the moment summer or whatever we've got here right now when the temperature is going up would you say kind of try and keep the humidity because you do like 65 percent as i think is the lowest is it or 62 maybe but keep would you say if it's getting hot try and go down with the humidity to avoid issues with yeah so, yeah. yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't direct my actions um, because of the temperature, but you have to measure the humidity inside your humidor. It could be that in your house, it's still mm -hmm. fine. If you don't see big fluctuations, if you have a calibrated hygrometer on the, on the inside, maybe the butler that you can also win tonight. Um, if, you, if you put that in and you don't get, you can set alerts for all different things. You can set an alert, you know, yeah. for changes if you, you know, and then, then, you can, then it's time to react. But as long as your humidity is stable, not nothing to worry about and then also is your palate able to spot the difference also you know because as much fun it is to overthink these things because i'm one of those guys ah, it kind of stresses me out okay so don't get overly stressed by humidity um levels as long as the change is not drastic and depending also on the amount of value you have in your humidor um but just keep it have a good tigrometer check it and then react accordingly if you feel that there's a need to do so. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking more like I've got a desktop, so there's not many cigars in there, but it's yeah. more yeah. It's about things like beetles or, you know, things you just things going wrong with, with you know, what yeah. I've got in there. Um, that yes. was it. But yeah, you say keep the humidity stable, that should yes. hopefully. Yes. Take care. As as good as you as as good as you can do, you know. Yeah. I mean, there are limits to what you can do, given you know your setup, um, and the climate you live in, of course. Um, but just do what you can do, and Bobada is the best thing to help you do that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Tobias, you put in the chat room that you may have a question. Oh what yes. This is a funny one, and I'm sorry, it's a bit of an ambush question. So imagine I'm using loads of this Bobby does, have loads of cigars, uh, I wish. But what do I do to recycle them? So I will be using loads of these packs and try to be um, kind of conscious. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do we do with them? So do you want to recycle them once they're... Or what's, uh, what, what's the safest way to dispose of them? Oh, you just throw them in your in your trash. I mean, it's it's nothing. So everything it's actually, I'd say like ninety percent of it is even biodegradable, you know. But one thing that isn't is the membrane. It's a polymer, so this just goes into your trash. So we, you cannot recycle them because it's um, it's really sprayed under the paper, so you really can't separate them. Um, so it just goes into trash. Oh, that's fine. Brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. Right, I think I've. Uh, I think that's the list of questions that people have come on. Uh, Ricardo, the where are you, sir? The deputy ambassador to Nicaragua. I think you've got. Are you still in the room, sir? Or has he gone home? I am. Aha! I can't see you. Good evening, Ricardo. So over to you, sir. Good evening, Scott, and thank you. Thank you very much for the chance to 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 make a comment, and and I have a couple of questions. Um, but first of all, I wanted to start by expressing um, as a representative of my country here to the UK, to Ireland, Iceland, and Portugal, how, how important it is for us um, on behalf, and this I say on behalf of the state, of the government, and of all of us Nicaraguans, how important this industry is, and how much each one of you here are really supporting an industry that's sustainable, has a tremendous social impact to all the developing nations, but also to the 
developed nations like this one that I'm in today, where the retailers and all the business and everybody, um, their subsistence is very much linked to the success of this industry. So I wanted to start by expressing that sincere gratitude to everyone for supporting us. And when I say us, I mean the, the industry. As a Nicaraguan, I cannot not feel part of it. And, and as a representative of my country, I do as well. And that goes to Bovida as well, who have made such a great, great impact uh, on the industry. Um, and today, um, coming and, and hearing, um, it's, been, it's been a real, real delight uh, learning about you, Mitchell, your story. It's really, really inspiring, sir, I have to say. I, in the many occasions we've met, I think we've always been in very busy events. And I never really had a chance so much to ask and hear a little bit more how you, how you got to where you are today. And it sounds like there's no, I mean, the, 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 there's no secret to the recipe, really. It's, it's hard work, resilience, and as you said, it look, a great idea and a great inspiration sometimes just stays in the air. So you really need to put the work to it. So while you run, Paul, and everybody in the, in the, the largest and most important um, specialists of cigars in the UK have done, um, for the industry is incredible. So for that, I, I, I really, really, my virtual hat, that if I have one, I will put down to you for that. And the reason why it's so important, and I personally spend so much time um, in this um, kind of environments, gatherings, is because not only because I love it, I really do, but it's because it's really important. I see it as my obligation, our obligation, to make sure that we do everything we can to promote the work you do, but also that we, that we watch your back and we're there to fight the difficult battles when it comes to legislation, when it comes to conversations with governments. That's what we're here for. And I love the fact that we've been able to develop this partnership. Um, I think even before I was posted here in, in London, while I was in Singapore, I had already been made aware through my ambassador about um, Scott and Tor. And one of the first things as soon as I landed here, I started working, was getting introduced to the work you do. And I have to say, the, the, the occasions that I've been at Liverpool, at Puffin Rooms, in Chester, um, I've been really, really impressed, um, not only by the tremendous work and the, and the incredible hospitality uh, and the beauty of, of what you've achieved and what you've all created. There is this, this bar, there's nothing like it that I've seen um, in, that, in that style um, over there. So my, my hats to you for that. And, what I'm trying today, I look and see there's a tiny little bit of the oliva. Um, I think this is the, the pizza me, the quintessential um, success of a marriage, of a great partnership that we as, as diplomats and as a government, we love and want to see more of, which is a partnership, Britain, Nicaragua, Honduras, Latin America, coming together and doing something of this quality. It's incredible. It doesn't happen in many industries. And for that, I'm, I'm really, really excited and motivated. And, and I really love it. I mean, Oliva, True State, those are two of my five cigars that I always, always have at least one left in my human, always. Um, and I love as well, of course, um, Alec Bradley, um, no doubt about it. Um, and I have to say, um, thank you, Scott, because and everyone in the, in the Thor team, because while we've seen that evolution of increasing the, the, the presence of our cigars, I don't see it as a battle with Cuba. Like you said, it is. It's just more choices for a growing demand. And for that, um, we love Cuba. I love Cuba. Nicaragua, in many ways, is what it is because of Cuba, and, and, and we have grown together. So for that, we, we hope that we keep developing this growth. Uh, and thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, my question, um, first one for, um, for you, Mitch. Um, and then one for you, Ben. Um, ben, I have to say, I've been really, really fascinated for what I've heard um, about Boveda, uh, no Bovida, Boveda, the Spanish word for the vault. Um, maybe there's something German-like, I don't know, um, but probably Latin origin. Um, so I have to say, you changed my life. I used to get so frustrated and complicated by trying as a newbie in the cigar world to find the right way of keeping these cigars. And it's just a piece of heaven, just putting that little package in there, which is beautiful. Anyways, I love it. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to watch and see, and what it does is incredible. And thank you today for the explanation. I've taken note of many things that I was doing wrong and what I can do better. 
Um, so Mitchell, you you are the king of the castle here in the UK, um, and clearly that that that's just a trend that I hope it stays. How about the next step abroad from this castle? Have you are you considering at any point? Have you thought of internationalizing a bit more? So put a pied a pied de terre in in Europe or, or somewhere else, and and get your castle grown there. Is that something that you run and have thought about and consider seriously? Uh, or am I putting you in the spot? Um, that's no. my question to you. <laughs> no, it's fine, Ricardo. It's a good question. But in fact, we did venture abroad because we opened La Casa del Habano in Hamburg many years ago. We sold that business. We own 50% of it. We sold that about, I think, six years ago now, something like that. Um, would we be venturing abroad again? It is quite possible, yes. It's something we're constantly looking at. The difficulty is in the, in the tobacco industry is lots of countries within Europe have controlled margins and the margins don't stack up um, as an economic case to run a business. Mm. So that takes out a lot of countries for a kickoff. And then you've got countries, for example, like Germany, mm. that are already so well represented with absolutely brilliant cigar specialists that there'd be no room for us to find a niche in the market. But there are other possibilities that we're in fact looking at currently. So yeah, we'll never say never again, but you know, the, the um, core of our business will always be the UK. It's a huge market. We love the UK market being 90% of our business. So um, this is where we're looking to expand more, but we're certainly not ruling out um, expanding in and outside of Europe in the future. Thank you, Mitchell. And I'm crossing my fingers that your forecast for the 50-50 and beyond um, between the two uh, origins of cigars happens to come through uh, and we'll be we'll be supporting you every step of the way to make sure that 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 hopefully materializes uh, thank you trust me ricardo i'm always right where cigars are concerned where my wife is concerned i'm always wrong <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, for bovida um quick question um and you're you're so technical and there's so much um technology behind this I'm um, not sure if you can share, but on one end, I see all these partnerships that you've made with incredible brands. Is there any of your products co-branded? Now that I see this beautiful co-branding, Olive or Shant, is that something that you guys do, have done, think about, or is that done something, Bovida and, 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 and a cigar name on the same branding, packaging, happening? Maybe I'm ignorant and it happens and I'm just asking something completely uh, not very helpful. And then the other question is, um, in terms of the evolution, I mean, are you, are you guys thinking of potentially new ways of, of, of how your product potentially, one of the things Tobias talked about, the, the recyclable elements of how eventually you can, you can find new ingredients that can have a similar effect whilst um, having that 10% that being able to, to become sustainable a little bit more than what it is. Um, what's next in that new technology that you could share with us about? What's next for Bovida and, and your science? behind it right so for Boboda you mean um, <laughs> so, um, um, so first let me let me thank you and and the great nation of Nicaragua for that great cigar industry of yours I mean we appreciate as an integral part of, of this global cigar place is even as we speak right now we're negotiating warehouse deal in, in Esteli in order to supply the Nicaraguan producers with our products, you know, to be shipped globally, to have it easier for you people, you know, to buy our products and not have it shipped from the States and all and so on. So uh, we, we really appreciate Nicaragua as a country and, and all the good work that you put into this industry is really amazing, honestly. Do you have to tip my hand as well, virtually. Um, for your questions. So, um, I kind of lost the questions now. So the, the second question, so what, what is, uh, let's start from, from the back. So the, the second question was, um, so what's, what are the new things coming? Um, recyclable, yeah, it's, it's, it's in our bucket list, um, but it's far from being, you know, something that we can speak of simply because, the, you know, the, 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 the polymers that we're using in order to do that, this is still um, like a classic, you know, mineral-based uh, solution. Maybe at some point when we have bioplastics available that can do that, you know, we will be able, you know, to substitute it. But up to this point, there isn't a solution that can do this. Um, when there is something, we're happy to look into it. Um, as of now, um, you have to know that, um, well, I have to understand that as we speak today, 
our biggest market is not cigars anymore. Our biggest market today is cannabis. Um, met thanks to a lot that's happening in Canada and the United States with legalization. Um, so there's a lot of thinking going on and, and studies being undertaken in order to understand that entire cannabis business. You know, we're in the cigar business for 23 years. So cannabis is new for us. You know, we're not cannabis people from scratch. So we have to learn and we have to adapt. And, but it's a, a great opportunity um, that, that will be presented as a medical product, maybe as a recreational product as well over here. For me, it's something really like a, a wine. Think of it, you have a wine that you don't only drink for its flavor, but also for the effect it has on your body. That would be a top seller, like a, a killer product, right? So, and this is something that, that where cannabis is today in you know places like California and so on, like Oregon. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential in Europe as well. Um, then your first question again was, I completely I lost you a little bit. I was bit. talking about the, well, thank you for that. I mean, and thank you first again for the, for the compliments. So I'm, I'm really excited that, to hear that you're looking at putting some business on the ground to support entry in the, in the Nicaraguan uh, on site directly. That's really, really great news. Really, really happy. I thought that. you'd like that. Yes. Absolutely. I'm, 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 <laughs> that's, that's the greatest news I've heard. No, it is. It is. We, we, appreciate, we appreciate all the efforts that, you're, yeah, that Nicaragua is doing, and it's, it's a great place. It's a great place. I was thinking um, about the co-branding. Um, so oh, co-branding. Yeah, right. Nah, yeah, I'm coming back. Okay, so we have only one co-branded product, and that is Boveda Zycar Boveda, if you so will. It's the same product, but we have a global distribution deal with Zycar, which is uh, like an American accessory manufacturer um, or brand. Um, they don't manufacture much in the States anymore. But um, so this is really the only thing where we do it because Boveda is one of the most renowned and one, one of the most successful brands that we have in the cigar industry. Um, we have a high recognition value. We have great recommendation values. It is a household name. So in order for us to find it attractive to do a co-brand, it has to be a somewhat very sweet deal. Okay. And up to this point, we haven't seen it other than Zyka that would, that had opened us to so many markets where we weren't, um, if it wasn't, wasn't for them. Um, but of course, you know, but apart from that, really, you, we get a lot of requests, you know, to do that. But the answer is usually, sorry, no. Thank you, no, and that makes sense. You have such a, such a strong brand that you, you that's, that's your baby that you need to create and, and grow. Well, thank you very much for your answers. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Scott, for the opportunity to, to ask him and, and, and look forward to, to learning more and growing through this process and this journey. Thank you. Brilliant, Ricardo. Thank you very much for your question. Um, there's a question in the chat room from Tom to Mitchell. Where are you, Tom? I'm here. Uh, hi, Mitch. But first I wanted to say thank you to Benjamin. That was a great presentation. And I'll echo Ricardo's words that uh, he's definitely changed my life. These, the products are just, they just take all the hassle. They just take all the hassle out of it. And you don't want your favorite hobby to be a hassle, do you? But Mitch, I hope you never smoke cigars around uh, petrol fumes, firstly. <laughs> <laughs> and, the second, and, second and secondly and thirdly they're related when do you think we'll have the placentia her because they're staring at me out the top of one of my glass top humidors and i'm finding it very hard to stay away from them and when do you think we'll be able to get back into the puffing room so i've never been my wife has given me permission to uh travel up to liverpool which is uh, fantastic as well as the miracle yep and <laughs> yeah when do you think we're going to be able to get back inside and uh, finally meet each other face to face well looking forward to that day for, for sure um for, for the Plasencia virtual health um i'd have to ask paul because he's in charge of all of this sort of stuff so i don't know but i will be there um for puffin rooms reopening um, we are currently actually refitting puffin rooms, which was very beautiful before, but will be double beautiful when we finished it. We're at the last stages of the um, refit out, and it is quite magnificent, I can tell you. It's like nothing I've ever seen in this country. Absolutely amazing. Um, we are hoping to be open for the last quarter of the year. Um, it could be uh, as early as September or as late as very early October. Um, we are, our main concern actually is protecting our staff because, you know, we're letting a load of people in there, 50, 60, 70 people, 
And the problem is currently with Corona is we don't know exactly where we're at with it. Um, and obviously in that environment, you're not wearing masks because you're smoking in the Termos lounge or you're drinking and eating and listening to music in the puffin rooms. Um, so you, it's not an environment where everyone's wearing masks other than my staff. And our prime concern is for our team to protect them. So until we've got better information from the government um, as to when it is definitely receding to a safe level for us to reopen, uh, we won't be able to reopen, but we are hoping it will be very early um, October at the latest. So we'll keep you informed if you're on our newsletter database, you'll certainly be informed and it'll be on social media and on our, on our websites as well. Fantastic. Look forward to welcoming you because it is an experience like no other. I mean, there's nothing like it in the country that I'm aware of. There's Boysdale, which is fantastic, but it's a very different experience. Um, ours is really like stepping back into, you know, the Josephine Baker times, the 20s, the 30s. It's a speakeasy. It's, uh, it's dark. It's intimate. It's just amazing. It's something, something to behold. If you've been, for anyone that's been there and experienced it, it is something very different. It's a lovely experience. Can't wait. Thank you. Yep. Count me in. If you, get the, if you get the chance, Tom, um, when I go to Liverpool, I stay at the Titanic Hotel in the, the the Docklands and it's only it, it, it it's a 10 minute walk or a 5 minute taxi ride but it's it's just a fantastic hotel with a terrace along the, the dry well it used to be a dry dock, it's a wet dock so you can sit, you can go there you can have your lunch, you can have a cigar you go down to the Termaeus in the afternoon, you can go to the puffin room in the evening and you've got 24 hours of cigar heaven it's just fantastic so there you go. You should you should do our, our thing with a Titanic hotel. You really should. And Definitely. Liverpool's a great city as well. I mean, you know, it's got great history with the Beatles. It's got great shopping, great restaurants, great bars. It's a really cool city. But just to go on to Bovida for one second, Benjamin, I'll just tell you, I've been a fan of, of Bovida, sorry, for way before Scott was involved in it, I was buying it. <laughs> and in fact, um, it, it, it's, it's down to me because I was walking the show with Scott in uh, Vegas, I think, years ago, and I took him to the stand and I said, you need to import this because we'll, we'll underwrite it, we'll buy everything you import, no problem at all because it's the most amazing product. So I've been a very, a very early on fan um, and, and still am. In fact, I, I tell everybody, you know, we sell every type of humidifier you can think of, cheap, expensive, everything. And I say, why make life complicated? The Bovida, make your life simple, make it easy. Look, I could, I could move the screen, you'd see I've got a big end table humidor here. I don't know how many cigars it stores, hundreds. I've been using Bovida for years and years in it. They dry out, you chuck them out, you replace them. My cigars are perfect all the time. I tell everybody, use the product. And in fact, we send out, I don't know, about seven, 800 um, pa packages of mail order cigars a day, sometimes a thousand actually, and every single one has a little baby bo Bovida um, in it because we know the cigars are going to be stored in good condition. They're going to get there in great condition. And the only thing, obviously, we can't help. One gentleman mentioned about the temperature. You can't help it. You've got to relocate your humidor. It's as simple as that. Get it into a cooler place. We can't help with the temperature, but at least with the humidity, use a, use the product. Make life easy because it's not rocket science with your product it's not rocket science it's easy it's just easy it's a brilliant product i absolutely love it and thanks for a great presentation it was it was very informative um and and i hope everybody else enjoyed it as well it was much more interesting than my bloody story anyway <laughs> thank well, you very much mitchell well listen guys i think that uh, brings us to a close tonight that's almost yeah. eight o'clock and i think the biggest yeah. compliment yeah. is the last two hours have just flown by, certainly for me anyway. Yeah, they have. Um, so I guess, uh, Benjamin, we need to come up with a Torvira. <laughs> 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 That's the future, the Torvira. Yeah. Can, so I, can like I just say one thing before we, before we go? Or two things, actually, two. There's one, one question, and it's, it's the first masterclass I've given where this question hasn't come up about how to recharge a Bovida pouch. We're it's British. A, we're yes. <laughs> yeah, that's very, very kind. Oh, you did a great job of working the market. But because I have the very, the best ultimate pro tip of how to recharge it. So you take a Tupperware box and you use, you take your old 69 Bovida, 
you buy a new 72 bar would have put it in and use it to recharge the 69 and you use the 69 again. Isn't that a great idea? Sure is. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, the second thing is that uh, if we have time, I'm always keen on getting feedback from, from the listeners about, about the masterclass. What did you like? What did you not like, especially? What was too complicated? What was, you know, what did you already know? What was extremely good? So if we just could have like one round of like content-wise feedback, that would be really helpful because this thing is really a, a work in progress. It will never stop being done, you know? Um, and it, it, even in the last couple of months, it has evolved great terms. Um, and so the feedback is always very important for us. We think that back through Anthony. Good idea. Yeah. You still there, AJ? Yeah, feed that back to me. Um, if you want to post on our Instagram or private message me on the C, uh, C guys Instagram. I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining in tonight. It's been really informative. I know from myself, it's, it's nice to know the thought process that goes behind these things. It's not just a case of, I'll just throw this in my, in my humidor. You know, and I like that. I can just throw it in my humidor and not have to worry about it. But knowing why I don't have to worry about it, it, it gives you a, a further appreciation of just how carefree and maintenance free Babita is. And I just want to say thanks to everyone. Thank you very much. Right. So I'll thank you, AJ, Paul, Mitchell. Thank you very much for allowing us to get crash your uh, your Zoom room tonight. Measure. Johnny, if you're still awake up in Liverpool, wherever you are. <laughs> Uh, Benjamin in Berlin, thank you very much indeed. We had Rob on uh, on tonight from the USA, so some of you might be familiar with some of the, the videos that Rob Ranger puts on with uh, Bovida. Uh, I noticed that Kate, my little pal from uh, Minnesota, came on for a little while, so lovely to see you, Kate. And uh, I, I wish you all a fantastic rest of Thursday evening and look forward to seeing you all on the next one we're doing in whenever Paul invites us. Yeah, yeah, so I'll just give you a quick, quick update on uh, Virtual Hearse. Uh, on the 19th, we just had listed today the world launch of the Ramon Alonez, uh, Alonez number 2, which will be on the 19th at 6.30. Uh, these were posted to our website uh, this afternoon. Then uh, at this stage, the uh, Placencia Orchard Selection will be held, uh, Virtual Herf will be held on the 26th of August. Uh, you can buy the sampling packs online. Uh, the date is still to be confirmed, but you can buy your cigars now and we'll confirm the date at a later stage. But at this stage, it'll be the 26th. And it'll be a, a joint uh, Virtual Herf with Florida Kana, and we'll have representation and doing a joint marriage and pairing, uh, uh, no, no, so the Placencia will be with Florida and the Ramon Alonis will be with Hein Cognac. So buy your samplers online and uh, we'll see you uh, on those dates. And don't forget, you can win your humidor, your 60 grams and your butler, okay? So on that note, I say good night to you all. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Good Adios. Night. Enjoy your cigars. Thank you. For coming.